Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our first summer worship service of 2024. My name's Jill Thomas, and I'm chair of the worship committee, and I'm filling in as Reverend Jennifer while she takes a vacation for the summer. Uh, starting today and through mid-August, our services will be led by people of the congregation. We have volunteers who have been very brave and stepped forward, and we've got a schedule of their topics in the, I think it's in the order of service. It's a very diverse and interesting group. I appreciate them and their bravery. During the summer, I will be asking for some help with the services. On Sunday mornings, you may be asked to do a reading or light or extinguish the chalice. The words will be supplied to you before the service and participation is optional. Feel free to say no but I hope you'll help. Volunteers are greatly appreciated. Our sermon next week is being presented by the Keepers of the Great Grove, which is our local uh, CUPS chapter, Covenant of Universalist Unitarian Pagans. The topic is Litha, and it's a ritual to mark the summer solstice. On July 21st, we're having a bit of an experiment for a service. Instead of our traditional readings, you are all invited to, to put on the worship service. We are going to have t-shirt theology. So find a t-shirt in your closet that represents something you believe in. Or maybe you had a spiritual experience in the Rocky Mountains and you have a t-shirt with the Rocky Mountains on it. Submit them to the office or to me, and the worship committee will go through them and pick out a few of them to use in the service, and those people whose t-shirts are picked will get to come up and do a two or three minute talk about their t-shirt and why it's meaningful. Now, I've been a UU for over 30 years, and one thing I know is it's hard to limit a UU to two or three minutes. So, we will have a gong, if we can find it. It's up in the attic. So you, you're forewarned. Then if you didn't get your t-shirt submitted or it didn't get chosen for the service, we'll have a clothesline back in Fellowship Hall that you can hang it from. This is an experiment. Please help make it successful. Uh, our church stands on 15 acres of woods, and we share that with deer and foxes. This morning, I found we share it with this moth that was about this big and it was green, and it was in the middle of the sidewalk. So I thank Dave Grubner, who was able to move it off the sidewalk and keep it safe. Uh, we also are very dedicated to maintaining our grounds to their original state. Uh, I don't know whether you knew, there was a, a remnant hill prairie that we're trying to maintain out there in the grounds. Our beautiful land was once the home of the Peoria people, for whom this uh, was the ancestral home long before the first Europeans arrived. We honor them for who they were and who they are and who, how they'll be in the future. Thank you for joining us in person and online. We welcome everyone, no matter your sexual orientation, your race, your creed, socioeconomic status, politics, or abilities. We welcome you with open arms and loving hearts. It helps if everyone wears a name tag. I'll put my number for coffee. And if you stay for visiting in Fellowship Hall, or we even have a Zoom room for Fellowship Hall, or just take the place of Fellowship Hall if you're online. Now, many of our members have told me that they were very intimidated the first time they went into Fellowship Hall. Some said they turned away at the door. They reported getting that deer in the headlights look. Some said it was because they feared, what if nobody talks to me? And others told me that their fear was, what if somebody talks to me? So we make it easier. We use our problem solvers. So we came up with a plan. Just inside the door is a special table with a sign on it. And all newcomers are welcome to sit there and be welcomed by a seasoned member. I hope you'll stay and you will meet some of the warmest and friendliest people you've ever met in your life. We also have a number of accommodations to help you get the most out of the service. 
There are hearing assist devices available from the ushers. There's a kid-friendly area back by the organ they, where your youngsters can crawl on the floor if they want to. Uh, there's tissue in, case, in every pew in case our service moves you to tears. There's fidgets in the baskets in the back. There's even a scent-free area if your nose is sensitive. If there's anything else we can do to help make your, serv the, your experience of the service better, please reach out to an usher or a greeter. Now is the time to turn all devices into worship mode. These diagrams should help. Or you can ask a teenager because they were born knowing how to do it. Uh, got a few announcements today. Uh, we've, I've got them on the wrong page. Uh, many of us celebrated Juneteenth yesterday uh, down at the Carver Center. And there's another event this weekend at Tree One School. Hmm? Oh, Tree One Park. It's a good thing she's here today. So now if you'd like to stand as you're willing and able, let's sing the opening hymn, We Laugh, We Cry, by Shelley Jackson Denham. <laughs>
I'd like to invite Anthony Dubro to come up and read our opening words. Co-regulation by Elizabeth Mount. From our very first breath, we reach out. Co-regulation, not self-regulation, is in our nature. We find our cues from the sun and the moon, from each parent and caregiver. We find our place in this great turning planet by turning to one another, generation to generation. We awaken to the dawn and fall asleep at the evening's end. Our life's journey is part of something greater, something simple, something divine. A flame cannot be lit without a spark. A life cannot begin without the air. We cannot begin to find ourselves without love. May we reach out to one another. May we offer love and nurturing care. May we join together in celebration of the interdependence of our lives. In this spirit, let us worship together. Our chalice lighting will be read today by Dave Grebner. We will be renewed by Pat Uribe Litchi. We come together with our tired minds and bodies, with our confusion and questions, our uncertainties and our fears. We come together with our hopes, with our pasts and our ideas, our passions and our faith. We come together bringing all of who we are, trusting that in gathering we will be renewed and that together we can create the world we long for. There's one word that always comes to my mind when I think of our church, and that is something that is what, it's what makes it successful. We are a sharing group. We share our spiritual journey. We share our love and support. We share food at every potluck. We share time and energy to keep the church operational. And we share our finances to keep the lights on. We also share our monetary wealth with a local agency, which aligns with our values. This month, our Share the Plate funds will be going to Look, It's My Book. This was started in 2008 with an alarming fact. Peoria Public School children were not reading at grade level. The proposed solution was to give books to the kids and let them keep them so they would get excited about reading. The Look It's My Book founder, Janet Roth, now has a team of dedicated volunteers uh, numbering over 500. They've distributed more than 300,000 books to children in all the Peoria public schools from kindergarten through fourth grade. They believe giving a child the choice to pick out their own book, then they will be more engaged and willing to read more often. Our UU Share the Plate program allows for one-third of the cash offering of our Sunday collection plate to be donated each month to a local nonprofit. You may put uh, in a check or a cash, put cash or indicate if it's for a pledge or split with the charity or if it should all go to the church. The ushers will pass the plates during music for meditation. And when they are done, I will light the first candle and you are invited to come forward and light a candle of your own. You may light a candle for joy, for concerns, for remembrance, for hope, for whatever is in your heart. Now, as the ushers come forward, I thank you for your generous support of the congregation and its work in the world.
As you look at our tables, you can see that one candle alone is not very bright. But when we all light candles, the glow from one strengthens the glow of its neighbors. It reminds me of our church that by sharing our life's milestones, good and bad, we become a stronger and more loving community. Today, I want to wish all of our fathers a happy Father's Day. Whether you're officially a father, a father figure, mentoring a youngster, I want to applaud you. That role is sometimes lacking in children's lives, so I'm glad you're taking on that role. Uh, it's not always an easy job, and it rarely gets the recognition that it deserves. Uh, I'd like to share with you that um, Linda Fairbanks, her father, Bruce Klingel, is in hospice now at, in Quincy. And we want to help Lucy McRae. Lucy has been a member of this church long before I even knew it existed. And she is celebrating her 90th, 95th birthday. And she's not just doing it one day. She's been doing it all week. Uh, yesterday, the caring committee needs to be commended. There was a, a memorial service for Glenn Zip. And the Caring Committee did an outstanding job, so thank you. I'd like to hold one more moment of silence for all the joys and concerns that are in our hearts but remain unspoken. Now is that time in our service where our children and their helpers will be sung out of the sanctuary. And Jesse, our director of Lifespan Religious Education, has activities going on that are both fun and educational for the kiddos.
I was recently an inpatient at St. Francis Medical Center uh, recovering from some spinal surgery. It had rained one night, but the morning dawned really bright. There was sun coming in the windows. It was gorgeous, and it was on the floor. In the hallway, there was a man who was dressed all in black and was wearing a clerical collar. It appeared as though he was waiting to speak to someone in a room down the hall. But we made eye contact, and we both smiled, and that smile turned into an invitation to conversation. He entered my room, greeted me good morning, and I replied in kind. I was really kind of curious as to what we would talk about. I assumed, based on his dress, that we came from different religious traditions. He didn't know how to. I wondered how much he knew about my UU heritage and religion. What were we going to talk about? He had, I think, what was a Jamaican accent, so at times he was hard to understand. He told me that on a day like today, he was jealous of his cat. He wished he could just curl up in that warm spot on the floor with the sun pouring in and just sit there and relax. The only movement he'd make all day would be just to stay in that spot of sun. I replied, you know, I have a dog that I'd be jealous of too. So we found some common ground. Then he noticed my book. It was called The Shared Pulpit. It was the book that was going with a class I was taking on how lay people can write sermons. That's why I'm here today. I had forgotten that I had a short sermon due when I got out of the hospital, so I took the book with me, planning on writing my sermon. Plans didn't go that well. Uh, upon seeing the book, his conversation and vocabulary changed just a little bit. I think he was assuming that that shared pulpit would be more like the shared pulpits he was used to instead of what a UU was used to. He shared with me how the Sisters of St. Francis and its clergy prayed for the patients and employees daily and asked if we could pray together. Strangely enough, the first thought that came to my mind was, I'm not that kind of girl. Well, what a strange thought to pop into my head. It could be the regular doses of pain management was influencing my thought, but actually it shouldn't have surprised me. Prior to my surgery, many of my Christian friends had said that they would be praying for me. I would often just say thank you and not give it a whole lot of thought. That had started me thinking about prayer and other words found in religious context. I thought about the definitions those words held for me when I first heard them, and how those definitions have changed and evolved over the 30 plus years I've been a UU. When I was quite young, I was confused about prayer. When people prayed for the sick or the needy, was it a popularity contest? If they've got enough praise from their prayers that God would heal them? Why didn't I get that Barbie doll I prayed for really hard before my eighth birthday? I just didn't understand prayer at all. When I was a bit older, I went through Episcopal Catechism, and we were taught about prayer. There were different kinds of prayers, if I remember right. There were prayers of thanksgiving, praise, intercession, confession, and I'm sure there were many more. And at that time, I believed in them all and practiced them religiously. Then I went through a rebellious stage where I rejected all that was religious. If someone asked me to pray, I would have said a polite, no thank you, or with my body language, I would have discouraged them. In my later life, and quite honestly, in my early years as a UU, my reaction would have been different. You see, in my early years, I was a bit more arrogant. I believed that my view on the spiritual was more enlightened. I would have internally rolled my eyes, silently sighed, and held his hand. Outwardly, it would appear I was joining in, but internally I was strictly going through the motions. I remember a time when one of my children went out to play and left the yard. I panicked. 
my neighbor, who was the wife of a clergyman, was outside, and I asked if she'd seen my child. She said no, but could she pray with me? She held my hand over the chain link fence, then she prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed that we would find my youngster safe and sound, and all I wanted to do was go look for Jordan. In retrospect, this type of reaction wasn't very spiritual and probably was a little disrespectful on both our parts. As I've matured into a Unitarian Universalist, I realize now there are so many ways to define prayer. The phrase thoughts and prayers after a school shooting or a natural disaster still makes me cringe. Without any accompanying action, it comes across to me as a lip service, especially from a politician. Today I'm speaking about the more personal types of prayer I have encountered. In thinking of the meaning of prayer, some definitions are very, very personal. I remember teaching RE, religious education, with another mom who defined prayer as a form of meditation. When she prayed, it wasn't to a deity. For her, praying was a meditative way to focus on a particular need, want, or wish. It helped her isolate the things that were important from the trivial things that were just taking up time in her mind. It helped her to sort out priorities. I like that definition of prayer. Now I'll talk more about prayer later, but for now I'd like to share some other words that have a different meaning for me now that I've become a UU for so long. In my head, I kind of refer to it as the UU thesara supporting to Joe. Um, take the word worship. During the services when I was growing up, a Sunday worship service meant honoring God, praising him, respecting him, showing him reverence and adoration. As a UU, the word now means something very different to me. When the pandemic abated and we were able to meet in person again, I was invited to join the board. After joining the board, I learned I was expected to join a committee. See how they get you sucked into these things? Looking around, I realized that our worship committee had been pretty well decimated by the pandemic. I wondered if I was really gonna be a good fit for that job. And you see, for the last decade or so, I had spent my time in the RE area, prepping for classes or teaching children. I think I only attended worship services on special occasion. I didn't think I was qualified, but there were no other volunteers for the chairmanship. And since I was willing, that willingness became eminently qualified. Now I'm beginning my second year as chair of the worship committee. Then I became curious. If we weren't worshiping God during a service, just what are we doing here? We use have worship services, but oh, how different they are from the Episcopal services I grew up with. Growing up as an Episcopalian, one service was much like the other. Prayers and some hymns were sung so frequently, they became committed to memory. Today, I can still recite the Lord's Prayer and the Nicene Creed and sing doxology. So what, what is a UU worship service? I went out to the UUA website and found their definition is a time to gather in community, to explore meaning, to live more deeply and intentionally, to share our milestones, both happy and sad. Since finally, or finding this definition on the UU website, it has changed how I view and experience worship. Growing up in the Episcopal Church when one service was so much like the other, it became rote. In our UU services, we use readings from all sources. I consider our readings a sort of UU version of prayer. Instead of pulling the text out of our a single book, the Bible, or our Book of Common Prayer, our readings can be sourced from almost anything. Uh, the UUA defines six sources of our religion. Direct experience, words and deeds of prophetic people, wisdom from the world's religions, Jewish and Christian teachings 
which call us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Humanist teachings which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and of science. And spiritual teachings of earth-centered tradition which celebrate the sacred, the sacred circle of life. And since we can use almost anything as sacred text, I don't know whether you were here a few weeks ago, Mike John Garius shared a reading that was written by an anonymous fourth grade girl. It was sacred. Even a college textbook contain, can contain scripture. I heard about the wedding of two engineers. One of the readings in their wedding service was the definition of an alloy. I wasn't there, so I'll have to paraphrase it. The textbook defined an alloy as the combining of metals, each having their own characteristics, resulting in a substance much stronger than the metals alone. Now, isn't that what we hope for when two people join in marriage? As they face the future, they are stronger together, just like an alloy. I think that's a perfect reading for joining a couple in marriage. Salvation is another word that has a different meaning for me now. I can remember being young and having, having recently learned about salvation in Sunday school. I had been taught that you earned your salvation by believing in God, being a good person, avoiding sin, and asking for forgiveness if you slipped up. Only then would you go to heaven, and if not, you were going to what a scary thought that we as children were brought up with. Hell and its eternal fire. I can remember discussing salvation with my mother. I was, I think, in primary school, and it was wintertime, and we didn't have a clothes dryer. My mom would hang the clothes up on clotheslines in the basement. It was the perfect setting for a deep theological discussion with a preacher. <laughs> There in that cinder block basement, I can remember grilling my mom. I asked questions like, now would the natives in the jungles who had not been taught about God and Jesus, would they be able to go to heaven? What about my friends that didn't go to church? Would they go to heaven? I don't remember the answers she gave, probably because I tend not to remember things I don't understand. I was really confused that if God loved us all, but he would still banish people to hell, it just didn't make sense. And simply because their geography didn't expose them to Christian dogma? I do remember being happy that my best friend, who went to a Baptist church and who had been saved, would be with me in heaven. I could envision us playing Barbies and riding bikes through eternity. I thought about the kid in my class who, that bullied me. He stole things from the teacher's desk. He stayed after school regularly. I was so glad he wasn't going to be around in heaven to pester me. Sometimes, though, I worried that I might not be good enough to get into heaven and was destined for hell. Such a scary thought for a young mind. When I found the Universalist Unitarian Church in my 30s, I learned about the concept of universal salvation. It meant that if God was truly our father and loved us as a father would, how could he condemn anyone to hell? I've heard us been called the no hell church. Mind blown. If I could have invented a God, and it was a loving God, this is the God I would create. The God that practices universal salvation. Today, I am an ex-Episcopalian and I'm not really a deist. I don't think I am anyway. I'm still trying to figure that out. I don't believe in a God as he or she is traditionally thought of. In fact, the word God has changed in meaning for me. Waldo Emerson wrote an essay called The Oversoul, and I can remember reading this when I was in fifth or sixth grade. In it, he explores the idea of a spiritual unity that transcends individual existence. Emerson suggests that there is a divine presence within each person, which he calls the oversoul, 
It connects all living beings to one another and to the universe as a whole. This really resonates with me. I do believe there's an energy or a spark shared by all things. It's an energy that doesn't require my praise or my adoration. It is an energy that treats us all the same. It is an energy that a you you might call our interconnected web of life. When I'm in situations when others are speaking of God, I just try to think of all good, that God is all good. But I realize the word, word still triggers me, and it's a word I'm not comfortable using. As I selected the readings and the hymns for this service and the rest of the summer, if the word God was in the text, I looked for a different reading. Now, back to my room at the hospital and the prayer. My Jamaican visitor clasped my hand between his two large ones, closed his eyes, and began to pray for me. He called upon God and the Holy Spirit to bless me and heal me. Looking back at the memory of his big, dark hand holding my smaller, very pale hand, it seemed to me almost a visual metaphor for our contrasting theological beliefs. So, what kind of girl am I now? I think I knew in the next few minutes after we started to pray. During that experience, I now know the kind of girl I am. I am the kind of girl who accepts the benediction being bestowed on me as coming from a place of love. I am the kind of girl who can recognize the honor I am being given. I am the kind of girl who can pray, not with the same words, not with the same thoughts, not to the same deity, but with my changing understanding of prayer, I can pray. I am the kind of girl who can share an experience with a Catholic Jamaican priest, accepting his sincere wishes for my recovery, and I can feel blessed by it. As you use, many of us have had experiences in more traditional churches that have sent us running from religion. Even words like sanctuary, hymnal, blessings can conjure up unpleasant memories. At one time, prayer was a triggering word for me. But now, with my new insight into myself and understanding the many nuances of the words, I can accept being prayed for as a gift. It is a gift from someone offering it to me in the spirit of love and caring and hope. What do you think of when someone says they will pray for you? Has becoming a you, you changed your vocabulary? What words or phrases have taken on new meanings for you? What words or phrases do you still need to rethink the meaning of? In order to live a more deliberate life, these are all good questions to ponder, and that's my challenge to you. When we learn to tweak the meaning of some of those more loaded words, I found I am much less judgmental. I am more accepting of people with different theologies. I am much more respectful of our religious differences. I am much more apt to give and receive love. The idea of universal love first attracted me to becoming a Universalist Unitarian, and I have tweaked those definitions a bit as well. I now think of universal love as a goal. It not only means that I am receiving universal love, but it means striving to live my life in such a way to bestow universal love to the world around me. Except it beats, I'll never love beats. In that hospital room, when my first thought was, I'm not that kind of girl, when I stopped to think a little more and having my hand held in that big warm palm of the priest, I found I could cherish his sincere caring for me, his hope for my recovery, and I knew that prayer came from a place of love. I like to think it came from universal love. If I had to do it over again, and a Catholic Jamaican priest asked if he could pray with me, I hope instead I would think, I guess I am that kind of girl.
Now I'd like you all to join in our closing hymn. This is going to be confusing. We are singing hymn number 193. Our faith is but a single gem, but we're going to sing it to the music of 371. So I would just follow the words on the screen. I'd like to invite Dave Gribner up for our final reading of today. It Becomes More by Reverend Amy Zucker Morgenstern. When we take fire from our chalice, it does not become less, it becomes more. And so we extinguish our chalice but we take its light and warmth with us, multiplying their power by all of our lives and sharing it with the world. As our service of today has come to a close, I would like to offer you my prayer for you. I pray that you choose to join us as we all take a unique and mysterious journey down our individual spiritual paths. I pray that words that have been a trigger in the past can take on new meanings and lose their power. I pray with gratitude and for all the kindnesses and the support we share with one another. My blessing is for all of you who make this community a loving place, are blessed. So may it be. Our worship has ended, but our service begins. Mm -hmm.